Marathon continues. Nuggets tonight. We'll have all that, co- all that coverage for you right here on Sacktown Sports. And uh, Katie's talked to that philosopher before. She joins us joins us live from Denver. Katie Christensen, good morning. Good morning, fellas. Happy Valentine's Day. Hey. Thank hey. You. you too. Pat still got us little <laughs> Valentine's cards with uh, with little chocolate candies. Yes. It's because he's amazing. I love Pat. Yeah. We feel loved. What what do you what what's the right move? I asked Coach Jim Les this earlier. What's the right move if uh, you're with someone and they say, uh, hey, "Just don't get me anything for let's just not do Valentine's Day." Like maybe a card. Oh, Dave. Um, I actually am one of those people that listen to that kind of stuff because I don't I don't play games. Mm. <laughs> so I'm not trying to to make it complicated. So I would say don't get them anything. <laughs> Just don't get them anything. It yeah. feels like a trap. It's not. I can't. I mean, I, I I'm with Katie on this one because I know that's like when someone says that, like, I know my wife, she, she means it. Isn't it better, though, to be told that and then you're like, oh, here. Oh, you can surprise if you want. But then, like, the worst is, like, they say that and then they're like, oh, I got you. What if they didn't get you anything and then they, you feel bad? Like, it's that. No, I, but I'm saying which is worse. That situation, which I agree is not great. Or they broke down and got you a little something, and you were like, "Oh, you said don't get you anything," and then you don't. I feel like that one's worse. <laughs> I know exactly. I'm better at basketball than I am at this. <laughs> well, never mind. Uh, Katie, last night um, you had a chance. Let me start here. You know, you I, I talked to you briefly last night. You were uh, watching the game as I mean, I know you're working, but as a fan, you're not calling the game. It's a TNT game. Mm-hmm. Do you are there things you like advantages? Obviously, beyond the you're not wearing a headset and calling a game differences in how you watch the game uh, as opposed to normal in that situation. Well, I watched the game at Marley Sports Bar downtown last night. It's just right across the street from the arena, and we had seats. We had our our normal broadcasting seats that we could have sat in and watched. And I know that Kyle did do that. Um, I had a friend in Phoenix. One of my best friends is there. So I spent it with her. But for me, I don't know, like, if you listen to me call a game, watching a game with me while I'm not working is a completely different experience. There's, there's anxiety. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of yelling. Um, there's probably frequent. Um, it's like riding know, in a car with you is what it is. It's like when you're driving. Uh, a lot yeah, of aggression. I would say I would, I'd say it's a little bit like that. Bad a words. Little bit, uh, outrageous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, what gave you anxiety last night? Then watching this one. You know, it was a close game the whole way through, and I thought that they played so incredibly well. Obviously, down the stretch, that's when things started to get a little bit. Um, frustrating you know it's it's crazy because you watch the game as a fan like that like in the arena I'm, I'm getting the stat sheet I'm looking at the stats I'm, I'm looking at all the things and so you know after the game when I saw the stat sheet I was just flabbergasted it is so rare that you see a team that you know there's the hustle categories is what we call them the three, it's, it's, you know, points in the paint, second chance points and fast break points. And it is so rare to see a team that absolutely annihilates their opponent in those three categories and loses the game. It's like, you, you just, it's so rare to see that happen. I mean, Kings had 72 points in the paint, 30 more, you know, they had over 20, you know, um, second chance points at over 20, like a 20 point advantage and fast break, you know, points. And, and you sit there and the only thing you can look at is like, wow, like the fouling was so just utterly uneven. And I don't feel like, like watching the game. I didn't feel like, like the Kings were, I, I just felt it, it felt off to me right but i'm like okay i'm watching the game as a fan you know so i don't know it's like one of those games that it was it was frustrating to watch and i'm sure it was frustrating for them um as a team because they did everything you can possibly do to win that game and i thought the the no call on domas down the stretch where you know he had uh booker i believe hanging off of his back like 
the explanation the officials gave Mike Brown, I think is unacceptable. Um, and you know, that's a foul. It's just a foul period. I'm pretty sure no one's allowed to, you know, put a saddle on you and ride you. Um, <laughs> even if it doesn't in, impact the play, you know what I mean? It's just, it, it was, it was frustrating. And this is just what it's going to be like for this team down the stretch. I mean, it's a, it, the standings in the West are absolutely insane and their schedule is not easy. So you're going to have to find ways to not lose those games. Katie Christensen with us. Katie, um, we played the Mike Brown clips in the last segment, and he, in a very thoughtful way, he wasn't ranting and raving and pulling laptops out, but he went after him. And I had said to Jason, you know. It's, it wasn't that the kindest, like, yes, going yes. after officials. He was like, uh, they're great. They're great guys. guys. They're great human beings. Mm-hmm. Am I wrong in thinking that it seems like Sabonis is starting to get a little bit of the shack whistle in the sense that I feel like the refs feel like if they call wrong at all, thank you. You're not wrong at all because he doesn't. And it's been that way for a while. He doesn't complain. That's, That's one of the big things. And this is one of the things that really, really frustrates me. I'm so sick and tired of watching players that, you know, moan after every freaking call and they complain and they yell at the officials and uh, you know we can go down the list of people that that do that i think we all know them without having to name names right um and they get calls and then you guys like domas i mean he's he's a he is a literal anomaly in the nba there just aren't very many of him he plays so hard he does not complain he just goes about his business and he gets like very, very little respect in the end. I mean, it's, it's shocking. Yeah, it, it, it is bizarre that it continues to happen to him. There's always, I think you guys talk about it on the broadcast. It wouldn't be a game without Simonis getting a hit to the jaw or to the face or somewhere at some yeah. point. Um, yeah. You know, when last night, Katie, watching the game as you did, what was your thought when, I thought there was a big impact in the game when Phoenix went small, which happened the last time. But over time, it's like Sacramento kind of figured it out, and that's what led to a comeback there where DeMontis started to dominate in the paint. So they they did kind of crack the code a little bit, didn't they? They did from the last time. And that obviously in the fourth quarter of the game um, when the Kings were in Phoenix uh, for the last matchup, that's when their, you know, what was a 20-point lead absolutely dissipated is they went small, um, and the Kings just stagnated. I mean, they, they, they didn't move ball in offense. They started trying to play ISO ball. And I thought that last time they did a, such a better job, you know, and they, they obviously learned the lesson from the first time that they, you know, uh, well, the last time, I guess you should say the first time that Phoenix did that to them and, and kind of showed them that small ball lineup. Um, but, you know, the reality of it is, is like, we we talk about this a lot and I, I know that sometimes it's frustrating to hear as fans and stuff like that and, and even other members of the media maybe. Um, but I truly believe in it. Like it's a perfect example of like you learn from losses, right? So the problem is is like you're you're having you have a problem as a team if you lose to multiple teams in the same way. So the last time Phoenix went small and they lost, they gave up that 20 point lead and, and Phoenix comes back and beats them. I haven't seen them struggle the same way uh, with small ball lineup. They haven't, they've actually dominated and Trey Lyles has actually been a big part of that. Um, and his ability to come in off the bench and, and, and stretch the floor and be effective on defense as well. Um, last night they didn't have Trey. So I thought they did a really great job with what they had. And that sometimes included Domas, um, I thought Alex Lynn came in and gave great minutes, but it didn't stall them out. They played their game. They continued to do that. So, you know, you look at, it's like, okay, what's the next thing a team's going to throw at them that they're going to have to figure out, but hopefully the small ball lineup isn't, you know, isn't an issue for them, regardless of who they play against. Katie Christensen joining us, analyst for your Sacramento Kings. Katie, I know on spec, I'm far more emotional and up and down about these games than you are. That's normal. Uh, but 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 taking that out of the equation, I you know a lot of a lot of folks on social media, even more than normal last night, I was really surprised at how 
uh, upset they were at how uh, at, at how completely beyond just a loss they were really really angry with this team. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they play like they did. I, I'm not angry about the loss. I hate losing, but if they played like they did last night for 82 games, they're winning 55 games. I feel like it's the anger is Portland and Charlotte and Detroit and all these yeah. stupid losses yeah. they had. I can't blame yeah. them for last night. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And listen, I, I do not begrudge fans for being upset after losses. Like they're entitled to that. Um, there's losses. If I'm being honest, there's losses that I get upset about. And um, a game like last night isn't really one that I get upset about. If I'm, if I'm, you know, kind of being frank with you, um, they, they, they played incredibly well the whole game. I don't feel like they had lapses. You know, I mean, they had, um, they played as close to a 48 minute game as you can, I believe. Um, there was three possessions in the very, very end of the game that they just, it made the difference in the game. And it's like, okay, so you're, you're also playing a team that, you know, went to the Western conference finals. What was it? A couple of years ago, have three superstar level players on there. And, uh, yeah, you got to give them some credit too. Like they made plays. So are you going to be mad that they were competitive against a team and played them close on the road the entire night and just didn't make the plays down the stretch? Are you going to be mad about, you know, kind of what happened in Houston, what happened, uh, against Charlotte, uh, what happened against Detroit? I mean, there's, there's a handful of those games that you can look at. And I generally, you know, I know it's different, and I, I seriously, I don't begrudge any fans of being upset. Be upset all you want. Like, you cheer for this team. You buy tickets. You buy merchandise. You come to games. Like, you watch them on TV. You 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 dedicate your time to being a fan to this team. You're allowed to be upset all you want. Um, the one thing that's really just, it's like, wow to me right now is like, and I asked De'Aaron, uh, you know, every season takes on its own personality and you know going into last night's game Kings had a better record than they did by one game than they did a year before um but last year they were in third place in the western conference at that juncture and this year they were in seventh place going into that game after that game they're in eighth place in the western conference like i asked Darren about like the different personality that each season takes on um and, you know, it's, it's crazy. He goes, you know, last year, like there were teams that had injuries. So I think that that impacted it. Um, he goes, the crazy thing is we think we're playing better than we were last year. And they are, they're a better team right now than they were last year at this point, but everybody else is just so damn good. Yeah. And so I think that that also impacts the, the overall feeling by fans, right? Of like, because it's it's not about just the losses, the wins and the losses. It's about looking at the standings, and then you start to get nervous because I think fans are smart. They understand how incredibly packed and stacked the West is, and you're sitting here going like, "Oh my God, is there a possibility that we can be better this year and actually miss the playoffs?" Mm-hmm. And I think fans are getting scared, and and I I totally get it. There's like a, a level of, you know, worry and, and all that. And I totally get that. Katie, want to know about something that like, so maybe not specifically last night, because you said you were watching with a friend at, uh, you know, across the street there, as opposed to where you normally get to sit at least at home, some road venues, you're down low, but we've seen Mike Brown at times uh, really get after play. Like he'll call that angry timeout and he the timeout with Kevin Herter. Is that yeah. What so, about? Yeah, yeah. So you weren't there I'm for so this specific thing, but what, <laughs> When you're down there, what do you kind of hear? What do you what do you learn from when he's calling, kind of calling a player out like that? Accountability. Yeah. And they respect him. They respect him. Um, and it's a moment, a teaching moment, where you can immediately. And it's it, last night. It was Kevin Herter. Multiple times. It's been. You know, we've seen it with Keegan. We've seen it with. Um, you know, pretty much. You know, everyone at, at some different point. Um, but I, I like that he does that because it's a, it's a moment where you can instantly stop and be like, walk out on the court and show what needed to be done. Show how you're supposed to handle that action. 
And it's not an embarrassment thing. It's not an anger thing. It's a teaching moment thing. And I think that he's brilliant at that because we've showed it in the past on broadcast, you know, and I'm trying to remember if it was Keegan or if it was Malik, the one that is like sticking out in my head, it was like the next like two or three possessions later did it right. And Mike Brown was jumping up and down and cheering on the sideline and clapping. It's like he used that timeout in that moment to try and correct something. So it doesn't happen five or six times before they're able to address it in a, in a timeout if they waited for the, you know, their normal timeout schedule. So I'm all for it. Like I, as a player, I responded to coaching well in that way. Um, and I, you know, I also like seeing, I don't know if you guys notice it, you know, Domas got called for a foul. Um, he goes over to the bench and he's talking to Jordy Fernandez and they're talking about the action and how they're guarding that, that high screen action and all the screen action out top. And they're having a conversation because he's trying to understand how do I fix this? Like, what am I doing wrong? And I love, love, love seeing that from these guys. Well, you saw him the other night with Trey Lyles. Remember he and Lyles got into it for like 20 seconds on a missed assignment and then they were good. That that was, I thought that was more about um, him not catching the pass in transition. Um, But you're right. A hundred percent. Accountability. They're able to talk to each other. And we saw it a lot last night with Domas. Um, And listen, it's a little different for me watching a game because I miss a lot of the little things like that that happen, like the conversation between players, because while I'm calling a game, yes, I'm watching the game, but I'm also doing 50 things. I've got the producer in my head. We've got a package coming up or I, I track the stats during the game so that I can track runs and makes and buckets and threes and like all of the things. So like I might look down turnovers. I might look down at, to track the the last play real quick and I might miss that interaction, but Domas had a ton of them last night where, you know, after something happened where they made a mistake on defense, he's talking to the players, no matter who it is. And they're having a conversation about it. I love that leadership, but I love that accountability because the one thing this team needs to do to be better is they need to be a better defensive team. And if you're not talking about mistakes and errors and you're not on the same page, you're not getting any better. And last night that really stuck out to me, the amount of conversation that was had on the defensive end, particularly after mistakes happened so that they could like really work instantly at, at correcting the behavior. Yeah. Katie, I, I'm sure it was a, a, did you guys get in pretty late to Denver last night for the turnaround yeah, for tonight? I really, really super apologize to you guys for being in bed and being so tired and sounding very tired. Um, somebody but, said yeah, that, uh, somebody said Katie, what is it? Where is it here? Uh, Katie is the most hungover sounding sober person <laughs> I've ever heard. <laughs> That's, That's pretty good. Um, yeah, no, I, I haven't even stood up yet. So I've been laying down the whole time and yeah, it's not a great. It's not a great sound, but um, I am it. really, really, t- I am really tired. So no StreamYard, <laughs> no video. Yeah, no. The last yard, part of the yeah. interview. Let me ask you a yeah. serious question. Wait, hold on. You did you? Well, yeah. Just yeah. so I just thought if you, yeah, I know you're. It's been a lot of road games here. How do you think the? What kind of energy do you think they have left for for the final one going into the break, which is always a challenge. It is a challenge. It's a mental challenge. I think more than it is a physical challenge because everyone. And I, I mean, everyone can muster energy for one game when you know you got a week off. Everybody can do that. Um, and so for me, it's more of a mental challenge and it's brutal because, you know, they just beat, like, I mean, beat the Nuggets. So they're not going to come out and have, like, not have that forefront in their mind. So they're going to have a really, really tough challenge tonight. But I, I can tell you, like, I feel like De'Aaron has been on fumes for a while. He really, really needs the break. Domas, to me, is like some kind of a, you know, a cyborg or something. I mean, he's, some, he's crazy. He's like mechanical. He, to me, plays harder than anybody else in this league. And I'm, I'm not saying that through purple goggles. I watch a lot of freaking NBA games. From the consistency of how he plays every single possession, both ends of the floor, and that he doesn't seem tired at 53 games into the year and seems like he's 
he's better than he was in October when he was freshest and has, you know, more stamina, it's, he's some kind of a robot. So, you know, but just knowing the fact that he's an actual human, he needs this week off, you know? So I, I just hope from a mental perspective that they come out and respond the, the you know, the adequate way tonight. Cause it's, it, this is, this is a brutal game. It is, it is a brutal game every year. Uh, that leads to my last question. Cause I was going to ask you, you, you mentioned you talked to De'Aaron and I know that a, this is an impossible question. B, there's no really way to answer it, real way to answer it. I'm just, when it, with De'Aaron, it's been kind of an enigma this year. He uh, he averaged 31 points the first month, 30 the second, 29 the third, 22 last month, and now he's up to 24. He's averaging 24 points this month. If you he, he had two 40 point games, you take that away, which I understand. Dude, is not I, I do want to I do want to call this. I sat down at our table last night and I looked at my friend and I was like, De'Aaron's getting 40 tonight. Mm. Yeah, it's TNT game. I, I called it. I called it. Yeah, and he's, go, he's going against Book. I didn't. I didn't call it because of the TNT game. I called it because of the matchup. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and but it, I, for it. I'd almost feel, but he had two 40-point games this month. You take that away, he's averaging like 17 points. And I know that's not oh. fair, but my, my, my question is this. Anyone who's watched him for his entire career, like I'd almost feel better if he didn't have the 40-point games, if he was consistently – down or consistently up it's it's been his inconsistency whether it's at the line whether it's scoring over the last two months and we went from like god is there something personal with him is he hurt like i'm not trying to criticize the man other than there just seems something You're like i'm looking for answers right like there seems <laughs> in, 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 in your mind it, is it most likely he's just drained he's drained yeah. he's been drained yeah, to me, that's what it's been the whole time. And like, I, you know, I'm gonna be honest. I don't pay a a lot of attention to social media. I don't. Good. I, I don't pay hardly any attention to like things that are written. And so, when was it recently where there was like this whole like, oh, Darren hasn't talked to the media in so many days, and I was like, what? Like, completely unaware of it. Um, because I'm around him all the time, and he was just normal. Um, so I don't, I don't know what was going on there. I never listen. I never dug deep into the research on that issue because I don't know that I really looked at that as an issue. Um, but I, for, for a while now, he had such a freaking amazing start to this season. Yeah. I mean, at what point wasn't he like fifth in the league in scoring or something? One point like he was that, first, like he, he led the league. I want to say for like two yeah. days. Yeah, but I'm not talking yeah. about the first week. I'm talking about like where you've been in the season now and you've got games under your belt. You know, you've got a handful of games. Um, he was consistently like he was uh, top five, I want to say, for a while. And then if that's hard to sustain 30 points, it is. And, you know, this team also doesn't play that style of basketball either. You know, like it really is like a free for all offensively. It's, it's whoever is getting good looks and it can be anyone, any given night. So I didn't think that he was going to continue to average 30 through the whole season. Um, but it has continued to drop, but I, I would say for a good month, month and a half, like I'm like, well, Darren, he's gassed. He's tired. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot to, to do what he does on both ends of the floor. And listen, guys, like uh, Shay Gilgis Alexander, he's a phenomenal player. There's a lot of similarities between him and uh, and De'Aaron Fox. Obviously, um, he was voted as an All Star in the Western Conference. Voted as an All Star in the Western Conference out of OKC, which I have mad respect for. Another super small market getting someone voted in is pretty amazing and he deserves it. I'll give him his flowers, but I've watched several of their games leading up to our game the other day. And, you know, as I watch games throughout the season, I look at different things. Like once I've seen the team a few times, I know the tendencies of players. Um, I know kind of what they run. Like I, I know what to watch for so we can draw on the telestrator, like things that the Kings might struggle with, what we struggle with in past games. But I specifically spent a whole game watching SGA defend and he leads the league in steals he might be one of the laziest defenders I've ever seen. Mm. And I don't know if it's an anomaly for those two games that I watched, but he does not work 
near as hard on the defensive end as De'Aaron Fox. So you're saying he's pick and poke, he's pick and poke and take chances, blow he's your assignment. Pick and poke, and like yeah. he's he absolutely he'll stand straight up with his hands down, not even in the stance. He'll be on ball. He'll be five feet off of you and help side on the you know on the weak side. Uh, he'll have a shooter on the perimeter and he'll totally turn his back to them and be staring at the action in the paint. Cause that's kind of where he goes. He takes gambles. Right. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm like, not one time did I see him get down in a stance and defend someone for a possession on ball. Like you see De'Aaron do throughout the game. So I, I honestly think that De'Aaron's jumping for their commitment to the defensive side of the ball has definitely impacted kind of how he's he's looked like he's had an energy dump here in the last month or so. Um, and you know what? I'm good with it because for this team to win, he has to be able to defend. And it's kind of like Keegan's numbers at the beginning of the season were down his shooting numbers because he had to adjust to being, you know, a player that's playing both sides of the floor. I feel like he did adjust. So to me, it's like go through the adversity now because you need to be able to do both of those things, De'Aaron Fox, in a playoff game in a seven game series. So go through the energy suck right now, adjust mentally, adjust physically, because, you know, in April and May, like you have to be able to do that. So yeah, I would say that, you know, his, his numbers drop. They the long answer to this question. There's a lot of reasons for it, but he is, he is definitely fatigued right now. That's Katie Christensen, the analyst for your Sacramento Kings. Anyone who's ever been to Marley's in Phoenix knows the food is good, like where Katie was eating last night. But look at this menu as we let you go here. Uh, Chris Verlaud and I both agree. Jason doesn't have the menu. We both agree the uh, Southwest egg rolls jump out. Uh, you've got the the skins, the pretzels, the sticks, the sandwiches. Uh, what was on the menu for you last night? And don't say a salad. Well, so listen, I used to work there. Yeah, no joke. Somebody, somebody said that. on the text line. They said, "Shout out to Katie." I said hi to her when she worked at Marley's years ago. So. Yeah, dude, I think I was working during spring training, and some Kings fans were down there. It was kind of wild. Um, yeah, so I had the the fried jalapeno burger. Ooh. Um, and Marley's French fries are like the like the best French fries I've ever had. Yeah, they're so freaking good. But you can also order them with cheese on them. Mm-hmm. Oh, so that a girl. I, had, I had cheese and jalapenos on my French fries and a jalapeno burger. It was phenomenal. Wow. Yeah, that's one of those where I'm sleeping alone that night if I do that. So, <laughs> uh, safe, safe flight. Don't you, anyway. Well, yeah, yeah, that's a great. <laughs> thanks, Katie. <laughs> uh, Valentine's Day. Yeah. I mean, you can't be worse than your Frenchie, right? Uh, no. But the best part about having the Frenchie is that uh, let's just say he sets a lot of he sets screens for me all the time. <laughs> 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 have, have a good call tonight. We'll uh, we'll see when you get home. All right. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs> when we come back, the screen. For down territory coming up right after. The Kings 